Okay, well, with, with that, we'll, I'll hand over to Mike Hazen. Is it the first time you've spoken there? <coughs> you managed to avoid speaking in the call. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, it's a very interesting uh, subject, which is it's up on the screen, so I won't need to repeat it. Um, and I received an email this afternoon telling me that any seminar title was over 100 characters couldn't be fitted onto the art show website, wasn't it? So I'm afraid um, we wouldn't have got much further than the peculiar career of Colonel. Excuse me, I can't count either. No. <laughs> well, Mike, what's John? Um, you know, but anyway, yeah. over to you, Mark. Okay, well, thank you, Keith, for allowing me to come on, and thank you for uh, turning up. I'm not sure how many people know who John was, but uh, this is really a scoping paper. And it arose because of a rather peculiar coming together of, of, of things. Uh, for reasons I won't explain, I was, I was and am very interested in the history of sewage and waterworks, uh, <laughs> and, uh, a much neglected topic. Uh, it occurred to me that um, although the names of the engineers, like Bazalgette, uh, are well known, nobody really talked about the navvies who did a lot of the work. And doing a little bit of investigation about the navvies, I came across this guy, John Ward, uh, who in the 18, uh, late 1880s, early 1890s, was a, a, a navvy leader. And then quite by chance, I came across a John Ward who was serving in the First World War uh, and led the British troops in Siberia. And the reason he did this was because in 1914, 15 and 16, he raised what were called navvies battalions. And navvies battalions went on to the Western Front to help lay the uh, infrastructure uh, for the trenches, the lines and so forth, going backwards and forwards for the railways. And they were later supplemented by colonial labour. Um, there's very little written on this, but it suddenly occurred to me, could it possibly be the case that the John Ward I was interested in through my rather bizarre interest in sewage was the same man who was popping up in the First World War and the same man who was popping up in Russia, and lo and behold, it is the same man. Um, and there's a quotation here from Bernard Pears, who was the Professor of Russian History in the School of Salonis, that is just two doors down the, uh, down the road, from an obituary of uh, Ward, um, saying that amongst all the freaks of history, I know none more surprising than that which brought him to, brought him to Siberia. Uh, and as we'll see, there are actually quite a lot of interesting freaks of history in Ward's career because he cuts across a whole series of, of different things. Um, but we've got two photographs to start with. One at the beginning, here he is in 1889, probably aged around about uh, 22, 23, writing a pamphlet on England's sacrifice to the god Mammon uh, for the uh, SDF. And there he is 30 years later, here he is, standing here, uh, in Siberia. I think this is Vladivostok, I uh, say so it's a scoping paper, you'll see in a minute that there's lots and lots of material on board, so I haven't tied down uh, everything, but these are Czech officers from the Czech Legion. Uh, during the war, uh, the uh, First World War, uh, captured Austro-Hungarian troops were offered the possibility of fighting for the Allies if they would come out against Austria-Hungary. And the ones who took that up were the Czechs, who saw this as a me method by, to, get, uh, to get Czech independence. And if you're familiar with even a vague outline of the beginnings of the Russian Civil War, it was the revolt of what were called the Czech legions in Siberia that really created the space in which the Civil War could uh, take place. So, so here he is, I think there's a Russian officer in the background, but these are other Czech officers. One further thing about this picture, which is really interesting, it's important in terms of, I think, understanding certain elements of Ward's career, you'll notice that in comparison to everybody else, he's massive. He's actually a very, very tall, big guy. Um, this is important, I think, in, uh, in two senses. Firstly, starting out life as a navvy, you had to, you know, it, it helped to be physically big. Uh, he wasn't fat, you can see, he's just a very, very big uh, person. Uh, he boasts that his parents were both 5 feet 11 tall, which of course in, in modern day terms is not fantastically big, but in 19th century terms was actually quite tall, uh, and he was well over 6 feet. So he, he tended to physically tower over people, but he was also a big man in the, in the sense that military historians and other people use this. He was a kind of leadership figure, people who, who, uh, the sort of figure who people would uh, gravitate around. I suppose you can also have big women in, in that sense, but the sort of people um, that, pe that, that were, were looked to uh, for leadership. So what I'm really going to talk about, if we can move this on, is going to just very quickly run through Ward's career, then tell you what I found out in terms of sources and why this is a scoping paper. 
and then pick on three aspects of his career which seem to me to be particularly interesting. Firstly, the role of uh, public works in late 19th century Victorian Britain, which I'm now quite excited about because I do consider myself to be an economic historian first, and I've never actually written much economic history. Um, but you'll see here that I think there's a really interesting and neglected story about the role of public works and the Navy. Then talk a little bit about the way in which war begins to shift politically and the way in which it gets seduced by the system. Fairly familiar argument, but I want to repose the question of how is it that people do move from um, the far left, if you like, to, in Ward's case, almost to the far right. And then say a little bit about his role uh, in, the, uh, in the Russian Civil War. So, who is this guy? Well, he's born in Surrey in 1866 into a working class artisan family. His father dies when he's age three, and his mother goes back to the countryside. And he has no real schooling because at the age of around about uh, six or seven, he goes to work on a farm. Um, the Foster's Education Act has been passed in 1871, 1771, but it doesn't make a great deal of difference, particularly in agriculture, he hasn't had time to set in. So as with many young kids uh, in the countryside, he's, he's pushed out to work with really no, uh, no schooling at all. And probably because he was a big lad, um, by 1876, sorry for the error on the thing, uh, he starts work as a navvy, and his first job is what's called an axle greaser. An axle greaser is very, very important, and when we're looking at child labour in 19th century Britain, as I'm sure you're aware, by the second half of the 19th century, it was good if you were a child to work in a factory, because there were factory acts that were beginning to protect you and stop that happening. But in much of the rest of the economy, children could still work without much protection. And the job of an axle greaser was basically at the end of the day to slide themselves under the axle with a pile of grease and put the grease on the axle. And you would do that whether it was a horse-drawn cart or whether it was a railway wagon. And this was the starting point for, for child la uh, um, labourers as axle greasers. And you did this every day of the year. <laughs> so it didn't matter if the ground was frozen and covered with snow, you still slid under and, uh, and did this. He graduates from being an axle greaser to becoming a full-time navvy, and, and in 1885 something bizarre happens. Uh, General Gordon's been killed in the Sudan. The British government decides that it's not a good idea to kill uh, generals, so they send in <laughs> troops, and they decide they want a railway. And the railway will run from the coast to the interior, and in order to build the railway, one of the tools of imperialism, they need navvies. So Ward is recruited as a teenager with around about 200 to 250 British navvies, and sent to the Sudan for about a couple of month period to help build the railway. The railway is a bit of a disaster, and in terms of British political history, it contributes, with, along with the whole Sudanese campaign, to the downfall of uh, a Gladstone uh, administration. He comes back, he comes back with a medal, and he comes back also quite angry. He continues to work on railways, and is also working on the Manchester Ship Canal. But because he's angry, when he comes back, he joins the SDF, and he becomes a junior militant in the SDF. And in 1886, he plays a strategic role in the Trafalgar Square riot, which is one of the big riots, Stedman Jones discusses it, um, where because the London police were trying to stop people having meetings in Trafalgar Square, the SDF tried to break that by having a monster meeting. And they had platforms all around the square, and the story of what happened depends on who you read, but one story is that they chose Ward to be arrested. He stood on platform five with his medal on, made a speech, and the police arrested him for you know, breaches of law and order. And he was then uh, remanded. He's defended because he's an honest working man. Uh, he's a working man who's fought for Queen and Country, although actually he's been a navvy. Uh, and he gets off with a 10 shilling fine. The consequence of this is that the Trafalgar Square ban on meetings is broken because it seems that you can have a meeting and all you can get is a 10, ten shilling fine. Whether that's actually what happens is an interesting question because if you think about it, the guy was so big that whether or not the SDF had set him up to be arrested, it would have been very difficult for him not to be seen because he was probably towering above the crowd. So, you know, if the police had said, get the big guy, they would have got him irrespective of, of this. But this gives him fantastic... Um, credibility. Heinemann refers to him as uh, R. John Ward. He's junior, because he's still only 21, 22, he's junior to people like Will Thorne and um, 
Tom Mann and Ben Tillett uh, and John Burns, but, but he's an honest worker who's a member of the SD, SDF. And he does loads and loads of meetings in London, he stands in elections, but in 1889, in the middle of the new unionism wave, he begins to work with others to create the Navis Union. And the argument is that if you're going to have general unions, there's no clearer example of a general labourer than a, a, a Navi. So in 1889, the Navis Union is created, and although it doesn't grow anywhere near as much as the dock workers and the uh, gas workers, nevertheless, there's a huge, well, there's initially significant surge of, of, of membership, particularly in London, but also on the Manchester Ship Canal, because the Manchester Ship Canal is being built exactly in the middle of the new unionism uh, wave. By the 1890s, he's moved away from the SDF towards a progressive liberal camp. He continues to work as a trade union leader in the, uh, in the navvies, but he now becomes a key figure in the National Democratic League. And in 1902 to 1906, he's actually building up support in Stoke, so there was a link to Stoke, I don't know if make this as a joke, um, in, uh, to become the parliamentary candidate there. In the constituency, which give rise to Stoke Central constituency. <laughs> so much so that our great historian Tristan Hunt, when an MP, writes about how proud he is to have, to have John Ward as an ancestor, uh, not only in Stoke, but also as a moral figure for the Labour Party in the 21st century because of the way in which he combined Labour radicalism and uh, patriotism. What was the National Democratic League? The National Democratic League was essentially a liberal reform organisation that was looking for constitutional reform. Um, I'm not, this is one of the areas I need to find out a lot more uh, about. It's something which um, figures in uh, liberal history, but they haven't actually done, done a great deal uh, about it. But it, it seems to be an organisation that acted as a, a vehicle that enabled people to move politically. You kept an aura of radicalism because you weren't happy with the, with the Constitution as it existed. So this would mean things like the House of Lords, um, it, and of course obviously it would mean the franchise, but not necessarily the women's franchise uh, at this point. In 1906, he becomes Labour MP for Stoke, and he remains Labour MP for Stoke until 1929. Between 1906 and 1917, he's a, a Lib Lab MP. He's thought of as being part of the Labour group. He's elected in 1906, but he refuses to accept the whip of the Labour Party. In 1918, he becomes a coalition Liberal. Uh, in 1924, he moves even further right and becomes a constitutionalist. Constitutionalists are liberals who are moving towards the Conservative Party. And then, one of these freaks of history, he loses his seat in 1929 to, of all people, Cynthia Mosley. Um, but within this period, he also does something uh, quite interesting. Between 1914 and 1920, he's on war service. Initially as a recruiter and then as a member of the Navy Battalions. In 1916, he's in France. He comes back and plays a strategic role in the House of Commons in the debate on conscription. He stands up and makes a very important speech as a working man defending con conscription. Then in 1917, he's sent to the Far East. His ship that he's on, the Tinderis, hits a mine off South Africa, uh, fortunately manages to survive, but he makes a very famous speech that becomes a great propaganda thing because he stands up as an officer. Uh, and there's, as you can go to the Imperial War Museum, there's a painting there of him standing on, on the deck, you know, advising people um, to follow orders or die like Englishmen. Uh, and it becomes a great pro propaganda thing. He's stationed for a period in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm not going to talk about child slavery, but whilst in Hong Kong, somebody complains to him about child slavery, and he figures in all the histories of Hong Kong. I've got a couple of pages there, because he, he takes up this issue. But much more interesting from our point of view, He's then sent with a battalion of 1,500 people to Vladivostok. They move down to Omsk, which is the headquarters of uh, Admiral Kolchak. And in 1919 in particular, late, uh, the first part of 1919, he's playing an absolutely strategic role, I'd argue, in the uh, advising and consolidating support for, for Admiral Kolchak. He's recalled in 1920. By this point, he's an anti-Bolshevik, an anti-communist, and also a war hero. And eventually he dies, 1934, honoured, but I think already beginning to be forgotten by that point. So his real heydays, if you like, between 1880, was 1885, possibly through to 1921, 1922. After that, in a sense, he's a bit out of place, you know, because he doesn't know where to go uh, politically. What so about see, Mosley? Sorry? Well, I mean, wouldn't his, well, I was trying to 
think about Oswald Mosley. Yeah. Well, he, he was standing in Stoke as a um, constitutionalist, which meant that he was almost a conservative. So the Labour was standing against him. Labour were getting more and more votes. And in 29, Cynthia Mosley stands as the Labour Party candidate and defeats him. In 3031, Mosley has uh, become the, the new party. Uh, and she loses the seat as a new party person, and then they move to become fascists. So, so he, he gets, in a sense, smashed by um, the radicalising force of 1928-1929 in terms of the Labour Party and Mosley's own position, Cynthia Mosley's own position, um, but then, as I said, it, it loses out. And Stoke Central, as it then becomes, is then this, in a sense, supposedly solid, emerges as this solid Labour seat, um, which now, uh, in its new form, has instead of Snell. Yes, let's leave that's his name for yeah. yes. Snell or Snell. Um, now, when I came across this, this rather bizarre story, like, like, like most people, um, I went to Wikipedia to find out a little bit more about John Wood. There's loads of stuff on Wikipedia. Um, turns out that most of it is, is stolen from John Savile. Uh, if you look at John Savile's Dictionary of Labour Biography, John, I think, is an absolutely fabulous uh, historian. Uh, and it has a very long entry on Wood because he wrote most of the entries on the uh, Labour MPs who were elected in 1906, and it seemed to me at that point that probably it, you know, he, he had said about all there was to say, but subsequently I have discovered that there's actually a huge amount. Um, as a consequence of the virtues of uh, electronic searching, I think that there are several hundred references to Ward in newspapers, some of them repetitious, but there's a huge, huge fund of material on him because he was popping up so frequently at different points between uh, 1889 in particular and his death in 1934. He wrote books, he wrote pamphlets, he wrote articles. There are archive materials which I haven't been able to check yet. Um, there are references to him in the Labour Party archives, there are references to him in Trade Union archives. The Mosley papers are at Birmingham. There are two files related to Cynthia Mosley about the 29 election when she wins, so I'm guessing there's, there's, there's stuff there. But most interesting of all, from my point of view, uh, the People's Library in Manchester has six boxes of papers relating to John Ward. When he died, it seems that his family gave the papers to the Staffordshire Record Office, because he was in Stoke, and there they sat for 30-odd years, 40-odd years, about 15 miles from me. I had no idea that they were there. Um, then when I became interested, someone had decided to move them to, to Manchester. Um, there are really only five boxes, because the sixth box has got like, largely photographs in it, but the five boxes include the manuscript of his autobiography, which is 90% complete. Unfortunately, the, the missing bits are um, some significant bits, but he, uh, it, he wrote his autobiography at the very end, end, end of his life. Uh, a mass of personal papers, some interesting but not particularly significant letters, the odd letter from Churchill and Asquith, you know, sympathising with him because his son has died and this kind of thing. Um, astonishingly, there are four letters from 1885-86, one sent on the ship going out to the Sudan, two sent whilst he's in the Sudan, and the fourth one, which is listed as being part of the Sudan, is actually written, I think, when he's on remand to his sister uh, as a result of the Trafalgar Square riots. Uh, and far from presenting a very heroic picture, I don't make this negative comment about him, because I think anyone in that situation, if you're, on, if you're, if you're arrested and you're in prison, you wouldn't be in the best state of mind. It's actually quite a, a, a despairing letter. Uh, he's wondering a little bit about uh, whether or not he's been abandoned. Um, a couple of weeks later, you know, he's out and, he, and he's the hero but in that intervening period. Um, who knows what's happening? So there's a mass of stuff, and also there's a mass of contextual stuff, because his career, I think, takes us through a whole series of areas that I knew very little about from the Sudan to things like the construction industry uh, and uh, navies, and I'll just sort of pause at this point to say if you are at all stimulated, there's an absolutely fabulous book on late 19th century navies by an amateur historian called Dick Sullivan. Uh, the book is also available free on the internet, and it's the sort of book I think that puts a lot of professional historians to, to shame because he wrote it about 30 years ago, he's updated it since then, and his archival work is absolutely phenomenal, but basically, what he's trying to do is to deal with the post-railway age navy on which little or nothing has been written. Everyone writes about the canal navies and the railway navies, but very little about what, what comes later. And basically, therefore, I've moved from being from thinking, you know, there's an interesting story that might be worth you know, a single paper to thinking there's actually quite a lot of stuff here. 
um, covering lots and lots of different themes. So, what? Well, the three things I've selected to try and titillate a little bit is firstly to think a little bit about something that I didn't consider until I became interested in sewage water systems. And that is how important the transformation of the infrastructure of Britain was in the second half of the 19th century. Many of you, if you're British historians, will be familiar with the arguments that were made in the 1970s by people like Samuel in History Workshop, where he talks about the predominance of hand labour, people like Musson talking about the, the development of steam power and arguing that very little steam power is being used before 1870. Most of the big surge in the use of steam power comes after 1870. Uh, we'll go back to that later. In terms of generalisation um, throughout the uh, economy, and people like McCloskey saying, well, how much of the economy had really been transformed in, in a technological uh, sense? Now, when it comes to the infrastructure, I think that if you actually look at the infrastructure, what we're actually seeing in Britain is that after 1870 in particular, there's a phenomenal increase in the scale of infrastructural change. The variety of projects and the complexity of projects far outweigh the sorts of projects that were occurring before 1870, which are primarily focused around things like the um, uh, railways. So after 1870, just to give you a kind of taster, you've got continued work on railways, the building of stations, the building of underground systems, new bridges, inland waterways, the Manchester Ship Canal, the whole development of reservoirs, water systems, uh, sewage systems, major public buildings, tunnels, the seven tunnels, most of the modern development of the British docks, uh, second half of the 19th century, so the Royal Albert, St. Catharines, Surrey Commercial, East and West India, Tilbury, Millwall, are either constructed after 1870 or reconstructed uh, after 1870. The Avonmouth docks, the Hull docks, most of the big barracks uh, are being either constructed or reconstructed, like Colchester, Gosport, Woolwich Arsenal, uh, Old Shot, and so forth, as well, of course, as a huge amount of... Um, civil engineering work that's going on in, in other countries. And the astonishing thing is, I think there's actually very little written about this. There's a very big literature on the building industry. But when you look at that literature, it's primarily about house building. Uh, there is, and, and railways, house building and railways. Once you go beyond that, there's much, much less uh, literature uh, on it. But what I think we see here is the significant economic role of big construction. Um, if anybody is sufficiently interested, I think the, there's an interesting technical question here about the role of big construction in the late 19th century economy, because the literature on the building industry is about an industry which, in terms of house building, is speculative, and therefore it tends to follow the economic cycle. Uh, and a lot of people, going back to Brindley Thomas and others, have argued that you've got a house building cycle across the Atlantic and in Britain um, that, is, that is central to the, to the economic cycle. Big construction, precisely because it is big construction, I think is counter-cyclical. Uh, in order to get the money, you need a booming economy, that otherwise people won't invest. But since it takes you, in the case of the Manchester Ship Canal or a reservoir, it might take you up to 10 years to build it. You know, maybe the economy's gone down by this point, but you've still got this counter possible counter-cyclical aspect of the big construction industry. And the construction companies were some of the biggest companies, in, or were the biggest companies in Britain, and they were some of the biggest companies uh, in, the, uh, in, in the world at this point. The Manchester Ship Canal uh, is interesting because the engineer stroke contractor for the Manchester Ship Canal was a guy called Walker, and he unfortunately died in the middle of the construction in 1889. His obituary tells us that on a comparatively short length of 25 miles of the Manchester Ship Canal, there are 221 miles of temporary railway, 90 excavating machines, 171 locomotives, 6,000 wagons, and 14,000 men employed. Mr. Walker was also concurrently with the canal, refurbishing the docks at Barry with 2,000 men employed, and at Buenos Aires with 5,000 men employed thus finding employment to an army of over 20,000 men. And he dies in 1889, and his work on the Manchester Ship Canal is taken over by a company that I've never heard of, uh, called uh, Aird and Lucas. Aird and Lucas was even bigger. Almost all the things I mentioned earlier, those reconstructions of the docks, 
those barracks, the public buildings, the um, uh, seafronts and so forth, the railway line extensions, the stations, Camel Street Station, Charing Cross Station, London Bridge, Liverpool Street, St Pancras, your railway station, all these were being done by Ed and Lucas in the 1870s through to the 1890s. And it's common, it was argued in the engineering journals that they were the biggest single employer in Britain at this point. And I've never heard of them. And I just, this is pretty, you know, absolutely pretty uh, amazing. And the consequence of this is, of course, there's very little literature either in on the nature of civil construction as a social process. There's, you can read about the building workers, there's trade union histories of the building workers. People like Richard Price have written about the nature of social relations in the building industry, but not, little or nothing about the uh, civil engineering. And the civil engineering workers were, of course, largely made up of navvies of one kind or another. Some of them might be skilled navvies in the sense that they might be using the excavating machines, but very many of them were navvies who were simply using a shovel and were having to shift two tons at least of earth a day per person into, uh, in, in, into railway uh, trucks. Uh, how many were they? I haven't gone through the census yet, but Ward and others tell us that there were probably between two and 300,000 at any point in the 1880s and the 1890s working on these civil en uh, engineering projects. And many of them were transient in the long term, but for a period of anything up to 10 years, they might be stuck in one place. I mean, if you're building the Manchester Ship Canal, then basically you're stuck in the same place in Manchester, uh, in places like Eccles and that, for up to a period of, 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 of 10 years. And what Ward is trying to do is therefore, in his SDF um, persona, trying to think about how you can organise this shifting uh, workforce of, of navvies, who I think are a much neglected part of the working class at the end of the 19th century. People like Terry Coleman and others have written about, obviously, them before the railway navvies, but how you deal with this huge, huge number of, of, of people. Some of whom went abroad as well, because if you've got these construction companies that are doing international stuff, uh, and Ed, by the way, Ed and Lucas also built the water systems, I should tell you, in uh, Copenhagen, uh, in Amsterdam, in uh, Berlin, they built the Aswan Dam uh, in Egypt, they built the Calcutta water systems. These are major, major international contractors uh, on a scale of McAlpines that we're familiar, more familiar with in the, in the 20th century, and carrying with them in part a workforce, some of whom are permanent, but others of whom are employed by subcontractors, because the construction industry in general has um, some con uh, subcontracting. Mm. But whereas the building industry has small-scale subcontracting, so you might uh, subcontract the, the bricklaying or you might subcontract the painting, obviously the subcontracting in the um, public works, civil engineering, is of, is of a much bigger scale. And it seems to me there's a whole interesting unexplored story here that Ward can open the door to, in part through the stories he tells us in his work as a trade union organiser about the nature of the organisation of navvying, both its strong points, its difficulties and so forth, and his own experience. So I think there's firstly an interesting story to be, to, to be told here, and I'm quite excited about trying to, uh, to do that. The difficulty is that Ward's union very much follows the pattern identified by Hobsbawm in his classic article, which is to say that by 1892-93, the whole economy is turning down, the um, general unions are going to struggle to survive, and it's made even worse for Ward by the fact that they finished the Manchester Ship Canal. <laughs> so suddenly you've got those 10 to 15,000 people who were stuck in one place in Manchester who are now going to go in all sorts of different directions. His organiser was a guy you might have heard of, a guy called Leonard Hall. Uh, Leonard Hall was the organiser of the Navis Union, based in Eccles. And as the Navis Union goes into decline, so they all begin to fall out with one another. Ward and Hall are even involved in a, uh, in, in a legal dispute. And then, but the Navis Union nevertheless manages to survive, primarily by becoming less of a general union and more of a benefit union. So much so that by 1906, people on the left are accusing Ward not only of being a sellout because he's moved politically, but accusing him essentially of being someone who's using the remains of the Navis Union essentially to get himself a living. Because the benefits are, there's no, little or no strike pay, the benefits that are paid out on a yearly basis are almost as much as the uh, salaries and so forth that go to the officials of whom um, uh, Ward is a key one. But 
By this point, in 1906, he becomes uh, an MP. Refuses to take the Labour whip, but nevertheless is still very much thought of as the worst kind of MP, because do you really want, in the Houses of Parliament, a navvy? A navvy who had been arrested in 1906, a navvy who could probably pick you up and thump you, <laughs> and a navvy uh, who deliberately wears a very flash sombrero hat when he tries to go into the House of Commons just to mark the amount as different. In those days, he was not a popular person with the Conservatives, says one MP. He used to sit in the house below the gangway on the government side, wearing a little huge sombrero hat, looking across between a navvy and an Italian brigand, the very type of Liberal Labour member most abhorrent to us. And in 1906, of course, you get this wave of new MPs coming in who are supposed to be working class MPs, both in the sense that they, many of them have a working class background and a poor background, and you know, none of them has, I think, a poorer background than uh, John Ward, if you could say Ramsey MacDonald and so forth, but he, didn't, he wasn't an actual greaser. You know? Um, and this kind of stuff. Uh, none of them have his credentials, uh, and he looks, therefore, to be the sort of person who might lead a radical left-wing revolt in the House of Commons. But within a matter of a few years, he's become one of the tamest of this new wave of MPs. And I think it's an interesting question as to how this, uh, how this happens. Ward is made an anti-imperialist by his experience in the Sudan. He seems to have had a pretty traumatic time in the Sudan. Um, he did see some fighting, but he wasn't supposed to because he was a navvy. Um, he saw lots of death and disease and so forth, and he takes the view, I think, at this point, that imperialism is not necessarily a good idea. He becomes an anti-militarist. He opposes the Boer War, uh, blames it in part on Jews as well. Uh, some of them do, but he's nevertheless uh, opposing it. But gradually, during the period 1906-1914, he begins to soften, and that softening is in part also a softening in terms of his attitude to imperialism, and a certain degree of enthusiasm for the British uh, state, because he very clearly takes the view that as an MP, he is a citizen first and a working class representative second. And it's, I think this is part of the ideological mechanism that enables him to shift. There's also, I think, an important sociological element here. Ward is a little bit, I think, duplicitous, but when it comes to the Labour Party demanding payment for MPs, what better person to have as the figurehead for your campaign than John Ward? Because John Ward has come from nowhere. In theory, he has no money at all, and he's standing up in 1906 and 1907, and Keir Hardy is using him, saying, you know, this is the sort of person who comes to Parliament, how can they survive? Even though in reality he's probably got a little bit of significant income coming in from the union on the side. So he comes, becomes a figurehead for the payment of, uh, of, of MPs. But he's also in the process of being, I think, seduced by the system. And by 1913, 1914 and into the war, I think he becomes a very, very useful tool of the system. Because he can claim to be a working class MP, he can claim to be a trade union MP, but by this point he's happy to speak against the left and about the trade unions. And this is the most important thing in 1916 in the conscription debates. There are two strategic, or actually three strategic interventions in the conscription debates in 1916. One comes from Arthur Henderson, who's in the government, another comes from Kleins, and the third one comes from Ward. And Ward stands up in 1916, and at a time when the TUC is still looking to oppose conscription, he stands up in the House of Commons and is roundly congratulated for a speech in which he says, you cannot argue that the trade unions are representative in 1916, because so many of the good trade unionists are fighting. They're away, they can't speak in this debate. But I can speak on their behalf, because I am a working man, I'm an MP in uniform, I'm a trade unionist, and I can tell you that would these people, were these people allowed back, they would be demanding conscription. And this enables him, I think, to play an important role in legitimising the move towards conscription at the level of the House of Commons and at the level of the political class. In, after he makes his speech, everyone is congratulating him and he's saying, they're saying this is the authentic voice of the working class. The TUC, the Labour people who are hesitating, they are not the authentic voice of the working class. But when he comes back from Russia, 
He's moved even further to the right, but of course the Labour movement is moving to the mm -hmm. left. So when he turns up at the TUC, instead of getting applause, he now gets roundly booed because he's now gone further and supported the, uh, the Bolsheviks. I also think by this point, he's to some extent becoming less of a useful tool for the establishment, because one of the things that's apparent by 1919 and 1920 is that, is that although they will depend to some extent upon ideology, and although they will to some extent depend upon Labour leaders to try and hold back the movement, if the worst comes to the worst, they will be prepared to use armed force. And Ward, to some extent, is a little bit now like a fish uh, out, of, out of water, because he, in a sense, is trying to speak a little bit for the honest soldier, the honest workman, but in a much more situation, a much sharper class conflict, then you have this problem about how he's going to be... Um, uh, whether or not he's going to be effective. So in terms of the Labour movement, post-1919, 1920, he's increasingly isolated, and not surprisingly, by the time that the general strike comes around, uh, he has no credibility at all in the Labour movement. But up until that point, he has had this very strategic position, less from the point of view of the Labour movement itself, more from the point of view of the establishment that is seeking to, uh, to, to use him. So how does he then get to uh, Russia? Well, he goes via... South Africa. Here is the painting that I referred to. The ship which has got his troops on it uh, has hit a mine and he stands up on the ship and is alleged to have said, officers and men of the 25th Middlesex Regiment, the diehards, you now have the supreme test of your lives, the one moment we all ought to have lived for, sorry, all the best traditions of your country and your race are in your keeping, a bail orders and we may be able to save you, but if we cannot then let us finish as English gentlemen. Standing suspecting you probably didn't say that. But this is the kind of story that gets enormous publicity. They managed to get the, the ship safely through to uh, South Africa, and he suddenly becomes a war hero, now in the sense not only of being the man who raised the Navy's battalion, but the man who acted as a good English officer did, and got his troops to act as good Englishmen sh uh, should do in a situation of, uh, of crisis. So by 1918, He's on his way to Hong Kong. Interestingly, in his memoirs, he says that in November, he's, he's, he's in Hong Kong, sorry, he's in Hong Kong in 1917. In his memoirs, he says that in November of 1917, they got orders to move to Vladivostok in November. But the orders were then withdrawn, and they got the orders again in the early part of 1918. Now, I haven't been able to establish from records I haven't had time to go into the historiography of the Russian Revolution itself. How serious that order was in November of 1917, because if, if they're significant, that suggests the British state was looking to intervene almost as the October Revolution was happening. Because remember, the October Revolution in our calendar happens in November, uh, not, not, not in October. But certainly by the early part of 1918, um, that he's being sent to uh, Vladivostok. And, you get here an interesting picture. This is him on parade in Omsk. Omsk is in the middle of Siberia, and Omsk becomes the centre of the counter-revolution. And you see here the English troops lining up on uh, parade. There are around about 120,000 foreign troops in Siberia. 70,000 of them are Japanese. Ward has operational command of the British troops but he also plays a leading role in organising all of the other troops, because there's a big problem. You've got the Americans there, you've got the Japanese there, you've got odds and sods from all over the place, you've got the, uh, the Czechs. You know, who's going to be the person that, that gives some kind of structure to what's, to what's going on? And Ward is that man. In addition to Ward, there are English advisers there, one of the most famous of whom is a guy called Knox, who also writes his um, uh, memoirs. But Knox doesn't have operational command of troops, whereas Ward does have operational command of, of troops. Now, the problem is that when you try to look at the historiography of the Russian Civil War, it has changed quite dramatically since 1989. It used to be thought of as a battle of good versus evil, where if you were a revolutionary, the goods were the Bolsheviks, and the evil were the whites. If you were a counter-revolutionary, <laughs> the evil ones were the Bolsheviks, and the counter-revolutionaries were the good. You can also take the view that they were both as bad uh, as one another. 
In Russia itself, and in Western writing, the first view that the Bolsheviks were the good guys and the counter revolutionaries the bad guys is almost completely disappeared now, apart from on, on, on the left. And you have this view that the counter revolutionaries were good or they were equally bad, equally as bad as one another. You've also had a major attempt to domesticate the Civil War, which I think is correct in one sense, because the Civil War was clearly a Russian Civil War. It was Russians, to a large extent, fighting uh, Russians. But this domestication of the Civil War has also led to a minimization of the role of foreign intervention. So foreign intervention as an explanatory factor has almost completely disappeared. And even those people who write about it tend to get ignored by mainstream um, accounts. And there has been some good work done on foreign intervention, but most of the books being written about the Civil War are essentially domesticated histories in which the Bolsheviks fight the counter-revolutionaries, the peasants and the Greens are also involved in warlordism and so forth, but the foreigners are not necessarily involved at all. And I hope you can see from the picture that that's not necessarily going to be the case at all, because even though war didn't have a huge number of troops at his own disposal, nevertheless, they looked to make a pretty impressive display in Ons. So what was his role? Well, I think his role was very important, and I think the role of foreign intervention is very important, because it seems to me that the essence of the Russian Civil War is that it's about asymmetric warfare. And by asymmetric warfare, I mean that you have a big power fighting a small power. In this instance, the small power is the revolutionaries. Because the warfare is asymmetric, the big power doesn't have to have a, do a great deal to have a pretty devastating impact. You know, it, it can, in a sense, flick its wrist, but it can still have quite a devastating impact. It is an interesting question as to how big an impact, the, uh, how big an effort was made. Um, I came across some interesting financial data to the effect that the British government was spending something of the order of £100 million pounds on intervention in 1918-1919 prices. And I suddenly thought, in 1918-1919, that's an awful lot of money. So I had some correspondence with a guy called Mark Harrison at uh, Warwick University, who's the leading British expert on this. Uh, and he was a little bit ambiguous about it, but, but he, he sort of was saying, well, if, if I'm right, and I'm not 100% sure I am right, because I've seen these figures quoted, I need to, need to track them down, that does actually mean quite a significant amount of money. In particular, it might have been something of the order of 1% of British G G GMP, GDP was going on the Russian Civil War. Now, the, the nature of asymmetric warfare means, of course, that if Russian GDP was around 10 to 15% of British GDP, then 1% of British GDP is a lot bigger share of, of Russian uh, GDP. So I think there's actually even a, an interesting argument about how big the, the effort was, and it was probably, I think, in, in, in material terms, a lot more valuable in, in monetary terms than people uh, allow. But what essentially was going on was that the Civil War involved firstly a blockade and isolation, it's a pity that Ian can't be here to talk to you about Rosmer's um, book on Moscow, because one of the interesting things in Rosmer's book on Moscow is the way in which he describes how difficult it was to actually get into Russia. Uh, there's quite a lot of interesting contextual stuff about how hard uh, it, uh, it, it actually was. Uh, the, the routes were very, very difficult, and he talks about people even dying getting in and get, trying, to get out, get, trying to get out of, of, of Russia. But not only were they well located, of course, they were also giving equipment and supplies, they were giving boots on the ground, they were giving advisors. And one of the things that Ward is very, very boastful of is that he was one of the major supports for Kolchak. He says in his memoirs, of course I had to appear neutral, but I was constantly advising the Admiral as to what to do. Now, there may be an element of uh, you know, uh, exaggeration uh, in this, but there seems quite a lot of contextual stuff in his papers uh, which do suggest that the that Kolchak did, on a number of key occasions, rely on him. He relied on him both in, in, in two senses. Firstly, Ward told Kolchak not to shoot people. And this was very important, because um, what Kolchak did in 1919 was to try and unify the, uh, all the people fighting the Bolsheviks. He tried to become supreme commander. And certain of his officers were quite anxious to shoot the socialist revolutionaries who had been opposing the Bolsheviks, but also were opposing Kolchak. And they were arrested 
And Ward said, look, you cannot kill these people. It will be absolutely disastrous if you kill these people because it will show that everything that the Bolsheviks are saying about you as being a monarchist, someone who wants to restore the old order, is correct. So he acts as a restraining force. But he also acts as uh, an advisor in terms of what Kolchak should do, in terms of how Kolchak should get his uh, act together. Now, I did think about putting a map on this, but the key thing to understand is that what happens in Siberia is a function of the Trans-Siberian Railway. Because the only way you can move is up and down the railway. So Ward starts in Vladivostok in the Far East, he gets to Omsk in the middle, and Kolchak is trying to run the campaigns from uh, Omsk. The Czechs move further west, they get to Ekaterinburg in early 18, 1918, that's where the um, Tsarist family is, uh, and as a result of which the Tsarist family uh, are executed for fear that they might go into the hands of the Czechs and then be liberated. They get as far as Kazan, where they manage to liberate the Tsarist gold reserve, or what, what the revolutionary gold reserve, and then the Czechs keep going backwards and forwards. For the period that Ward was in Siberia, he was also doing the same thing. When he was not advising Kolchak, he was moving up and down the Trans-Siberian Railway with an interpreter, going into the engineering works, which were the main industrial centres on the Trans-Siberian Railway, and telling people how important it was that they stood up against the Bolsheviks, and how in doing so they could rely on the fact that they had the support of the British government. And I think the most interesting aspect, therefore, of the foreign support in the, foreign, in, in the Russian Civil War is perhaps not the financial one, not the equipment, not even the advisors, not even the boots on the ground, but the fourth thing I've listed there, which is hope. In early 1918, I think the counter-revolutionaries are in disarray. They're not at all sure what to do. Some of them simply want to run away with as much as they, they can get. But by 1919, they're organising and organised, and one of the reasons they become organised is they have hope, and one of the things that gives them hope is foreign intervention. Big powers stand behind us. And how do they know that? Because they've got this person there in Siberia, John Ward, who claims to speak on, the part of the, on behalf of the British government, has got 1,500 troops, and is able to coordinate and liaise with Knox and Kolchak and others in order to give some kind of, of structure to, to what is going on. Bernard Pears, in his biography, says, and I quote, that once British support was removed, then support for Kolchak disappeared with it uh, as well. Uh, he takes the view by the 19, 1930s that it was essentially only foreign support that was enabling the um, counter revolutionaries to sustain uh, their, their opposition, particularly in the Siberia. Uh, and General Knox, by the summer of 1919, when Ward and his troops are beginning to be withdrawn, is saying that Kolchak is now becoming a lost cause. So much of a lost cause that Ward is angry to the end of his life that the British abandoned Kolchak. He's gone to Siberia, he's talked about honour, he's talked about the fact that Britain will support honourable men, he believes that Kolchak is an honourable man, and therefore the British should keep supporting him, but if they're not going to support him, they should at least rescue him. And he's not rescued. He's captured and, uh, and he's shot. And therefore, Ward returns, in a sense, embarrassed, I suspect, for the rest of his life about the way in which people have treated Kolchak, but nevertheless proud of his own role. So, I'll give you a kind of scoping exercise. Where does that leave us? I'm not 100% sure in terms of my own interests. I thought there might be a couple of articles here. I think there's the possibility of a big book biography. There are five boxes of papers, including an auto unpublished autobiography, would take quite a long time, and it's obviously ambitious. More immediately, uh, I think that this has stimulated my interest in thinking about a paper on civil engineering history. I think it's certainly worth writing a paper, and I've constructed the outlines in it, on Ward and the Navis. His role in the Russian Civil War, I think, is also something that is certainly worth um, revisiting and taking much more seriously. And I think those four letters, or three of which were related to Sudan in 1885, are themselves worthy, maybe, of, uh, of, of publication, because I don't think that there are many letters from soldiers surviving at that time, let alone people who were, in a sense, recruited in a semi-military capacity to go, to go overseas to, to, to fight for the British Empire and to create um, the tools of imperialism.
So I started out with a fairly modest aim in terms of finding out about ward and sewers, and I've ended up finding someone, I think, who sort of tracks through key issues uh, in British history. He's a middle-level figure, but the reason that there are so many references in, in, about him in newspapers is that whenever in, something interesting is happening, he seems to pop up, and in one or two occasions he pops up in quite a dramatic way, not least of them the Russian Civil War. Thank you.